Dear learners, welcome back to the course on Organizational Behavior, Individual Dynamics in Organization. Today we move to the last lecture of Module 4, where we discuss on affect and emotions, specifically the emotions and moods and applications at workplace. So in the previous few lectures, we have looked into affect and emotions in detail, what essentially it is, what is the relevance of affect and emotions in the discipline of organizational behavior management and specifically we are looked into some of the theories, some of the empirical research that has happened in and around the area of moods, emotions, etc. Today, we try to discuss the most important aspect which are the applications. Applications of emotions and moods in workplace. I am Dr. Abraham Sirlaisak, I am an assistant professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology. Guwahati. So straight away moving into today's session, we we'll look into today's theme, a negotiator who feigns anger has an advantage over opponent. So this is the theme with which we try to understand what exactly do you mean by uh, emotions and moods in terms of its uh, use or usefulness in the world of practice. So, when we look into different um, areas in, in this lecture, we specifically try to dig into the relevance of emotions and moods in, in different zones or different functional uh, requirements of a particular organization. So, first and the foremost one would be to consider selection. Now, considering emotional intelligence specifically for jobs demanding a high degree of social interaction. When we look into uh, the, the entire selection recruitment and selection process, if you are actually going in for a job which has a certain requirement of mingling with others, which has to take the entire group together, which has certain requirements, it could be like a team leader, inter it could be anything, any sector, any domain. You you must have seen or observed that there are some jobs which require you to be the people's person. There are some jobs which require you to be, uh, uh, you know, the leader, the inevitable leader who has to emerge and there, there might be no, no actual designation given as a leader, but still you have to lead the team from the front. So those situations, those selection processes actually evokes or actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, takes up a requirement where you need to have an emotionally balanced person. Individuals recruited specifically on the basis of emotional intelligence outperform those who scored lower in terms of EI, emotional intelligence, according to studies. So this is where the relevance of the selection the, the very introduction of individuals into the organization becomes relevant. When you are looking into, uh, you know, selection and recruitment on a macro scale, it is just to add the workforce. But more than that, we have, we will have uh, extensive discussion on PO fit, P, uh, J fit, person organization, person job fit, etc. Where we actually look into what is the relevance of the right person, the right job. I have actually mentioned this in, in a couple of previous lectures as well. So when we actually want individuals who are emotionally balanced and who can make use of emotions to the right way, they will obviously make the organization move ahead. So this is what the relevance of emotions and moods are there in selection. When you come to decision making specifically, every single organization uh, will have a sort of dilemma when it comes to decision making. What it could be in terms of, let's say, at, at a lower level management, it could happen at the middle level management, even strategic decision making is always a difficult thing to actually you know undertake or actually happen when you look into uh, decision making we we have seen bounded rationality we have looked into informed choices we have looked into things which we can uh, things which equip us to take a better decision so considering all these aspects even emotion happens to be one of the most critical aspect when it comes to decision making traditional approaches to the study of decision making organization has emphasized rationality because every single decision making should be backed by some rationale or some rational thought behind it. 
if your decisions are not rational, if you are making random decisions, tendencies or chances are that you are going to make a wrong decision. So whenever there is a decision making opportunity or avenue that comes across within your organization or within your work sphere, it is essential that there should be a rational decision making. But organizational behavior researchers specifically are increasingly finding that moods and emotions have important effects on decision making. So this is where the relevance of our topic in the uh, area of decision making becomes relevant. People in good moods specifically or who are experiencing let's say positive emotions specifically are more likely than others to use uh, heuristics or rules of thumb and make good decisions quickly. If you are, let's say, the corollary will be that you are negative, you are having a lot of negative thoughts, you are not uh, optimistic about the current scenario within the organization, chances are that you are not in a good mood or that you are not in a good position to make good decisions. So decision making obviously has a precursor which happens to be the mood. When you are going in, in through a bad phase, when you have, let's say, we have looked into the, the antecedents of, you know, emotions, moods, etc. in the previous lecture. Considering that, recall those antecedents and consider them when you are having those factors in play in your organization, within your workforce, you will see that the decision making can be improvised when you are emotionally balanced. You can think of any particular example. Let's, let's look into example of a salesperson. If let's say he is going through a situation where he has to meet a particular deadline, but uh, he is working in a zone which is not so positive about the particular product. So he can think of innovative ways to actually uh, sell the product. But to have a clear understanding or to bring out those innovative ideas, you need to have a, a clear mind, a clear thought process. So for that, you have to be in a state of positive emotion. You have to be state in a state of positive mood. So this is where the relevance of emotion becomes critical when it comes to decision making. So we have seen the relevance of emotions and moods in selection. We have also looked into the relevance of emotions and moods in decision making. Another important aspect when it comes to emotions and moods is creativity. Now, can good mood lead to more creative ideas? Just where we left our, our previous discussion, the whole point of being creative is the consistent ability to bring in consistent ideas. It's consistent ability. It's not only the ability. It's like today you do it and that's it. You are name creative, nothing like that you have to consistently keep on delivering. That's when you are termed as, you are actually getting uh, the, the title as being creative. So for that, you essentially require certain bit of plain mind, a cool mind, and that comes when you are positively upbeat. Let's look into certain views which are supporting this argument of creativity, will also look into some of the opposing views. When you are looking into certain supporting views specifically, we see that people in good moods tend to be more creative than people in bad moods. Now, this is critical. When you are in good mood, when people are experiencing positive moods or emotions, they are more flexible and open. This is the open mindset which I was talking about. They are flexible and open in their thinking which may explain why they are more creative. There are situations when you are, when you are negatively uh, affected by uh, let's say some events, some episodes that is actually uh, creating a lot of or a churning of a lot of negative emotions and moods within you. Then there are chances that you are not in the right mindset to make critical decisions and especially you are not in a creative mindset because you cannot have clear idea or clear understanding or clear thought process that is happening in your mind. So this is the reason or this are some of the supporting views why creativity can be a part of or can be an outcome of having good mood. When you are also looking into supporting views, we have to also understand there are certain opposing views to this thought, to this narrative. When people are in positive moods, they may feel relaxed. 
if I'm in good mood, let's say, things must be going okay and I must not need to think of new ideas. There could be uh, such a thought that, that can come to mind. Complacency could, could actually prevail here and not engage in critical thinking necessary for some forms of creativity. So there are positive aspects or positive arguments that are made against the mood. I would personally uh, you know, like to believe in the positive uh, supporting views, but we should not ignore the negative views or the opposing views regarding creativity and emotional connect. Because when we look into situations like complacency, you feel that you are relaxed. Let's say uh, there are situations when we, uh, when we see individuals who are very creative, who are, who are very hardworking, they get into a, a very comfortable job and they see that their salary is being credited regularly. There is hardly anything linked uh, in terms of the perks and incentives towards their particular performance. So there is no performance linked incentive. The moment they feel, they see this, they tend to be uh, very uh, relaxed. They uh, start becoming uh, a little bit of burden to the organization. So there are individuals which we see. So this opposing view has its own relevance when we look at the larger scheme of things. So creativity essentially need not be case of a positive outcome. Opposing view can be also taken into consideration or uh, can be given or can be taken into consideration in face value. When we look into opposing views uh, regarding creativity, there are individuals, not in the majority, but there are individuals, there are co-workers of yours whom you might see that they might be very exuberant, very enthusiastic when they were working uh, in, in a creative setup. But as soon as they move into a particular environment where the mood is good, where the emotions are uh, very much upbeat, very much positive, they do not have anything to worry. They feel that their salary or their remuneration comes on time and there is nothing, no single element linked to their performance. Even if they don't perform, they get the guarantee that even if they don't perform, there is a possibility or there, there, there is a certainty that they are going to get paid. In such situations, creativity takes a hit. So that is all also to be taken into consideration. So let's conclude this creativity debate uh, by understanding that when we conceptualize moods as active feelings like let's say anger, fear or elation or uh, even contrast this with deactivating moods. So one would be active feelings, another would be deactivating moods like sorrow, depression or serenity. All the activating moods specifically, whether positive or negative, because we have seen uh, even anger, fear, etc. Or, or can come into the basket of activating modes. So all the activating modes, whether positive or negative, seem to lead to more creativity, whereas deactivating modes specifically lead to less creativity. So this is interesting. It, it need not be that uh, anger will not create or anger will not actually uh, reinforce creativity. It, it, it could be that and anger could be an antecedent of creativity. It could be that fear could be an antecedent of creativity. So when we classify moods as activating and deactivating moods, activating where it could be either positive or negative. This is relevant. It could be either positive or negative. Even like uh, feelings like anger, fear, uh, which are essentially negative or even positive aspects like elation and con uh, elation will actually lead you to more creativity. So this is where we end this debate on creativity and it's connected with emotion. Now let's look into motivation specifically. What's the connection between motivation and emotion? One study set two groups of people to solving word puzzles specifically. So the first group saw a very funny video to, to boost up their uh, happiness or uh, to increase the positivity in their, in their emotion intended to put the subjects in, in actually good mode. So the other group was not shown this particular uh, video specifically or the clip uh, specifically and they started working on the puzzles on right uh, away. The, at, at the moment they started working after seeing the video, one group saw the video, another group were not uh, given that video. Now positive mood group, let's look into them first, reported higher expectations of being able to solve the puzzles. 
and also they worked harder at them and solved more puzzles as a result. So this is an outcome. This is an outcome of the positivity, the, the emotional change that was initiated or triggered at the beginning. The second study, which found that giving uh, people performance feedback, that has a different effect. Whether real or fake, it does not matter. Performance feedback influenced their mood specifically, which then influenced their motivation. So in one aspect, we understand, with one study, we understand that a trigger, a positive mom moment, a positive feedback. It could be as simple as a positive clip. It could be as simple as a positive incident. You can relate it with yourself. You introspect within yourself. In an organization, you just go into, let's say, you, you, uh, it could be as simple as somebody is greeting you with a pleasant smile. Somebody is giving you a handshake. Somebody is giving or uh, let's say greeting you, uh, maybe some seasons greeting, etc. So all these aspects are small, minor, minute things, but that can have a greater impact. Your day can be very refreshing. Your day can be very encouraging. The whole day would go in a very productive manner. You might have observed this. Now, this is where the importance of having a positive emotion comes into motivation. When you actually are greeted or a simple act of positivity is being transferred, there is a contagion effect which we'll discuss in detail. So that will actually give you a better uh, uh, motivation to work throughout and inevitably you might observe that those days are your highly, one of the highly productive days that have happened. And there could be also a relevance of feedback, performance feedback. Somebody is appreciating you. There are some due recognitions that are coming your way. Such situations will actually warrant a, a level of deeper appreciation towards the job, towards the organization, and moreover, it will, it will instill a sense of belongingness and you start working uh, without hesitation and you become more productive. So these are some of the essential connect that motivation has or emotion has with uh, respect to motivation. Now let's look uh, in the, the, the relevance of uh, emotion in leadership. Effective leaders specifically rely on emotional appeals to help people convey their messages. So when you look into, uh, this is more relevant when you look into leaders from political sphere. If you, when you look into leaders, even in even in uh, in your HR context, you will see that some leaders are are very vibrant. They have the capability. Some leaders have the capability to give a boost to give a boost to the morale of the workforce. There are some leaders who can, who can take the entire crowd with themselves. They can entertain the crowd with themselves. They can keep the uh, crowd uh, silent. Let's say there are speakers who are very articulative, who are, who we, he, you must have observed that the entire crowd is, uh, you know, making noise. Suddenly they start speaking and there is pin drop silence among the crowd. Now this is the mark of a leader and some Sometimes the leader takes this to the next level by making an emotional appeal, by, by creating, by hitting the right note in terms of the emotion when it comes to the, the, the audience or when it comes to the workforce as the case may be. So this is where the connect or the relevance of emotion with leadership comes into picture. Uh, there are emotions in speeches and it's often the critical element that makes us accept or reject a particular message. Sometimes, sometimes you feel that uh, people tend to add a cert certain emotion. Let, let us be very honest and frank. They might be faking it or they might be genuine. Whatever the case may be, if it is considered, if it is uh, interpreted as genuine, there are chances that you are tend to obey that particular message or it, you are tend to listen to that message in a more uh, enhanced way. You are more open to those messages. You are more uh, open to such uh, uh, you know, communications that are coming from uh, up, emo emotional appeals of such leaders. So basically, by arousing emotions and linking them to an appealing vision, Leaders increase the likelihood that managers and employees alike 
will accept change. So there could be situations where they are not willing to change. There could be situations where they are not ready to accept the change in the first place. But leaders who are, who are very creative in arousing emotions and actually linking them to an appealing vision because you have to show them. The leader has to show them. Tomorrow, every one of you will get into a leadership position. So you have to show the workforce some appealing position that you have to be here. That objective, that goal setting is essential for you to take the workforce to that level. If you are a leader who is not able to bring clarity to the workforce, to the people who are behind you, who are following you, that where you want to reach, if you are not able to set a clear goal, then you might not be that effective a leader, which will ultimately be relevant or reflected in the coming times. So basically, you have to set the goal. You have to make the, make the vision appealing. It is not like you are showing, showing some random vision and a random target or objective which could be either unachievable or which is not uh, so, so much appealing to others, that might have a, a negative effect on the whole process. Rather, if you are able to show them something which is appealing, an appealing vision and make an emotional appeal towards that, then things are going to work in your favor. So this is essentially the connect leadership is having with negotiation. Now, yet another important aspect in when it comes to OBM, organizational behavior management, specifically is negotiation. Let's look into the connection emotion is having with negotiation. This is where uh, almost the theme of the lecture lies. When you are looking into different studies in, in the area of negotiation specifically, it has shown that negotiator who feigns anger has an advantage over the opponent. The moment you are you are showing this, you know, uh, you know, you are you are showing your angry face or you are showing the communication is filled with anger, there is a tone and tenor which is marked by anger, you try to secure an upper hand within that negotiation. When a negotiator shows anger, the opponent concludes that the negotiator has conceded all she can and so there are chances that they might just give in. So displaying a negative motion such as anger could be effective but feeling bad about one's performance appear to impair future negotiations. So somewhere you see that during, uh, if, you, if you detail the negotiation process, you'll see that there are people who tend to go back, revisit the, uh, the negotiating uh, article or whatever the process of negotiation is all about. So when you are actually going through the process, through the thick and thin of negotiation, you will see that emotion has a critical role to play. Sometimes you feel, sometimes you even you fake anger, you fake certain authority that you have to get it. This is the uh, ultimate, uh, you know, uh, aim of your uh, or objective of your organization, and you are representing your organization so that you secure that. Sometimes there are there are people who who are very meek. The emotions are very weak. They are not able to actually uh, put a claim on whatever the things on the table are. So such negotiation, it could be either uh, in terms of an agreement in, in, in terms of an infrastructural project. It could be an agreement in terms of a, a product delivery. It could be in terms of a, an, an, an order of or placement of an order for a particular service. Anything it could be. Whatever be the, be the matter of consideration is, there should be a certain level of emotion that is at play and those emotions if positively communicated will have immense effect will have a very good effect and there are chances that the negotiation will turn out to be uh, something in favor of you as a party to the negotiation so this is what the connection of emotion is there with negotiation so when it comes to negotiation there are different processes associated with this but essentially if you are a person who can bring out the emotion in a positive way show the other party that you are more concerned with the right objective and with the right 
uh, establishment of this particular uh, outcome of negotiation, then there are chances that you are going to win the negotiation. Another important field where you can actually look into uh, the relevance of emotion is customer service. Now, customer service is, is a very uh, creative way of uh, people uh, disclosing their uh, commitment towards a particular product or particular service in general. A worker's emotional state influences customer service, no doubt about it, which influences levels of repeat businesses and of customer satisfaction. So when you are looking into customer service and uh, the, the whole process of customer service hovers around repeat businesses and customer satisfaction. If you are uh, you know providing the customer with good customer service, it, there are chances that the customer is becoming loyal to the brand to the product or to the company and there are chances that he or she is going to place orders or repeat orders. And another important aspect is customer satisfaction. There might not be the case of repeat orders, but customer satisfaction can necessarily bring in a positive vibe. The, there are chances that the person who is a customer of you can bring in more and more satisfied customers, more and more interested customers, uh, provided he or she is a satisfied customer. So studies indicate that a matching effect between employee and customer emotions called emotional contagion, this is what I referred in between, emotional contagion helps in spreading of similar emotion from service provider to customer. So this is very much interesting a topic. Emotional contagion is important mainly because customers who catch the positive moods or emotions of employees shop longer. This is just with respect to a shopping experience. You can relate this emotional contagion in any business aspect, any managerial aspect, any organizational behavior aspect. Emotional contagion is nothing but a spread of similar emotion from one party to another. So if a person, let's say who is shopping, catches the positive mood or emotions of the employees, this is where it is important that the individuals become uh, more creative and more friendly with the people who are uh, in, in, in connect with them. Now let's look into job attitudes. Now, people who had a good day at work tend to be in a better mood at home that evening and vice versa. So, chances are that there are situations when you are in a bad mood and you take it out, the frustration or uh, whatever feelings you had the, uh, which are pent up, all these are vented out at your family. There are situations like that. Now, that would be a wrong thing to do. People who have a stressful day particularly at work also have trouble relaxing after they get off work. So all these situations are reciprocatory, all these situations are related in general. Disturbance in family and relationships are a natural consequence if you are having a bad day. You must have observed in your workplace, if you are having a bad day, you tend to be dissatisfied, not uh, happy about the scheme of things that have happened in the organization. You are always disgruntled, you are always, uh, sometimes you are disgusted, sometimes you are frustrated, sometimes you are sad, depressed. All these negative emotions are going to create a difficult feeling for you when you are in your home, where you are with your family. They are not concerned with what happened in your uh, organization specifically. They were never the factor uh, or they were never the elements which triggered any of those activities that have happened in your organization, but still they have to bear the brunt. This is where job attitude becomes relevant. What you see in your job, you have to uh, uh, address those things at your job and th that ends there. You need not take those things to your home. That is where the relevance of emotion and job attitude is displayed. That is where the importance of keeping your job at the job becomes relevant is getting underscored. Now when you are at 
a discussion of emotion and the different factors it it actually touches upon within an organization or within the discipline of organizational behavior management i cannot conclude without taking deviant workplace behaviors we have a, a specific module related to knowledge hiding knowledge sharing uh, and other counterproductive organizational behaviors other deviant workplace behaviors but that said i would like to connect the emotion and deviant workplace here uh, workplace behaviors here slightly workplace deviant behaviors specifically are situations or are, are, are scenarios where people behave in ways that violate established norms and threaten the organization either or its members or even both now this is bit concerning to an organization in general because when people start behaving in a different way which is different to the established norms you are an organization let's say which promotes knowledge sharing you are an organization which promotes everything that has to be shared an open mindset you are an organization or you work for an organization which is which is very much uh, critical about anything hidden or any any of such counterproductive behaviors but then if you are taking up counterproductive or deviant workplace behaviors which are going against the established norms of the organization you tend to become a problem for the organization you have issues with other members who could be the coworkers who could be your your reporting authority or even your subordinates all of them tend to see you in a in a in a different uh, way they tend to start behaving you in a different way because reciprocity is a truth reciprocity is the ultimate truth how you behave with them is the is is a way which triggers a reciprocal behavior so there could be situations where you cut a sorry figure not only with respect to your higher management but also with respect to the people whom you work with or even your subordinates so deviant workplace behaviors can create such troubles for you so these behaviors can be treated to negative emotions such as uh, let's say anger envy disgust etc so when you look into deviant workplace behavior specifically let's take an example of aggression aggression leads to negative behavior and escalates an already existing unpleasant situation the moment you have to observe aggression maybe within your team maybe within your organization in general if it is coming to that level where you are seeing aggression there are chances that there was already an unpleasant situation and aggression has happened as a consequence of those or that particular unpleasant situation in those unpleasant or that particular unpleasant situation aggression will actually lead to something which is not the right thing that can or that can solve the issue so it will only add fuel to the fire of what is known as deviant workplace behavior it will only add fuel to work against the established norms of the organization and ultimately threaten the organization its members or both now this is where the safety and injury at work also needs to be considered when you are looking into negative affectivity it leads to more injuries at work because you are in not in the right uh, emotional state you are there to harm others you are there to threaten others you are there to create threats or create danger for others individuals in negative moods tend to be more anxious which can make them less able to cope effectively with hazards they are they are always doubtful they are always uh, critical anxious they they don't know what to do and this inevitably makes the coping strategies ineffective negative moods also make people more distractible and distractions can undoubtedly lead to careless behaviors when you are looking into negative mood specifically it can make people uh, distracted from the entire scheme of things they are not so much uh, interested in aspects uh, they are not so much keen on uh, taking up the job seriously and this is where 
the safety and injury at work is also at, uh, uh, at uh, limbo where people are not in, in a right mindset. They, there could be situations where people are uh, strongly opposing or there could be uh, situations where there is aggression, which I've already mentioned, is an outcome of already existing unpleasant situation. So all this will have an influence or impact on the safety and uh, you know, injury at workplace. So that said, this concludes the module where we have discussed in depth about emotion. We discussed what emotions are, what's the difference between mood, emotions, etc. We looked into certain theories connecting emotion. We also looked into certain aspects which connected emotions to the workplace scenario. And in this particular lecture, we looked into the applications. Uh, we also looked into some of the empirical research that has happened. And based on that, we also, looked, uh, we also looked into the applications of emotions at workplace. I would like to conclude by just stating one thing, emotional contagion. If you are in a positive mood, that could be translated and transferred to another individual. Let's say you are having two or three co-workers sitting with you. You are in a negative mood. You are in a negative, uh, filled with negative emotions. There are chances that you spread this towards the entire team. You spread this towards the entire group and ultimately you spread this to entire organization. If you are a cheerful person, it is difficult. But if you are a cheerful person, if you are happy about things, there are a lot of, uh, you know, happy thoughts or emotions that are running you every now and then. Chances are that you make the team happy. You make the team cordial. You make the team productive. You make the group happy, group productive and ultimately there are chances that you make the organization happy, you make the organization cordial and you make the organization productive. On that note, we'll end today's lecture. We'll see you in the next class with a new module. Till then, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.